our democracy is falling on its face right now because of this lack of empathy and because of hyper-specialization. It's hyper-specialization in AI that's crushing us as a society. We're seeing the downfall of Rome right now. What would good effective change in the school systems look like? I believe there's a whole spiritual aspect that's missing. Our brains are more of antenna than they are hard drive storage units. I can't imagine retraining the teachers and, you know, I mean, this is, this is not going to happen. So when people say to me, oh, they want to learn more about, they want to be experts in physics or engineering, then I immediately say to them, then go study music. Someone who's good in music can fall in love with math because he starts to see that, wait, math and music are the same thing. Robert Edward Grant. Robert is a polymath with a profound impact across multiple disciplines. Blending mathematics, art, science, and philosophy to uncover deeper insights into the nature of reality. As an innovator, author, and speaker, Robert's work bridges the gap between ancient wisdom and modern science challenging us to expand our horizons and rethink the world around us. We've separated out all of our learning into these disparate aspects because we want to perceive it as separate, and all of it is based on economy. What about the doctors? Doctors are hyper-specialized. I wouldn't want to go to generalized doctor instead of the specialized one. Sorry, I'm going to say this. I spent 30 years in healthcare. It's becoming one of the worst in the world. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Robert, welcome. It's been a year. It has been a year, been quite a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to start our conversation by actually reading your words. Okay. So, a philosophy that applied becomes mathematics, applied mathematics becomes geometry. If applied philosophy is mathematics, then applied mathematics is geometry. Geometry is simply the music that we experience with our eyes and applied geometry becomes physics and applied physics becomes chemistry and applied chemistry becomes biology and applied biology becomes uh, psychology and applied psychology becomes sociology and applied sociology becomes philosophy. It's a big circle. Each one is just a different perspective or angle of looking at this one truth. First of all, it makes my head spinning after I was reading it first time. So today we will be speaking all about this big circle of interdisciplinary approaches. Okay. So my question to you is, uh, you say that geometry is simply the music that we experience with our eyes. Mm -hmm. Could you please explain to me, if I were 10 years old, what exactly do you mean? Okay, so if we, if we look at the brain, let's start by looking at the human brain. And what is called the left temporal lobe is where we process mathematics. And the right temporal lobe, so exactly opposite, so from here to here, right over your temple, right in your head, is where you process music. Now, this assumes you're right-handed. If you're left-handed, then it would be the opposite. Mm -hmm. Okay, but, but the left temporal lobe is math. The right temporal lobe is music. And the center of your brain is where you process language and geometry. So geometry is the nexus between music and mathematics. So you could say that the abstract form of music is just arithmetic. And the, you know, the tangible form of music is what we listen to. But actually, it's all based off of frequency and all based off of harmonic principle. So if you really get deep into music and music theory, you'll find that all of it is mathematical literally all of it. So for example, every note in a scale, and it's as basic as this, you know, whether it's the minor second or the major second or the minor third or the major third or the perfect fourth and the fifth, right? And the diminished fifth, the augmented fourth, and all of these are purely mathematical intervals. And that separation happens right at the center of a scale, which is the square root of two. It would be the same as taking a line of one, another line of one, 
right? And having it have a perpendicular relationship between those two lines of one and one. And then the hypotenuse of that triangle, that right triangle, would be the square root of two. I just did a, a proof on this yesterday on Instagram, on an Instagram live, because so many people are asking if one times one is really the square, you know, if, if one times one really equals two rather than one because of the podcast that Terrence Howard did with Joe Rogan. And what I showed was no. And I think a lot of people are confused on this. It's really amazing to me. I've had <laughs> questions this morning from people that have all said questions like, hey, you know, if I start with, you know, three bananas and I multiply the, uh, those three bananas by zero, then shouldn't I still have three bananas? And I'm like, you know, if I could have the face slap emoji and the cringe emoji all wrapped into one, it would be that. It would be like the cringe and the face slap at the same time. Because the easy way to think about this and what I'm starting to realize is that our educational system is so lacking. It's really mind boggling. And the way we should think about this, the way that I taught my children this as well, is that it's like if you have no groupings of three bananas, then you have no bananas, right? So right. think of it as groupings. People get stuck on this multiplication thing, and they're calling it multiplication when actually just think of it the way I just said. If you have one grouping of three bananas, you have three bananas. If you have two groupings of three bananas, you have six bananas. If you have three groupings of three bananas, you have nine bananas. This is not rocket science. And actually, all of it is music. So in the musical scale, to form the, the, the diminished fifth, which splits exactly down the center of a scale, it is the square root of two. If the square root of two was only one, then we would have no music and we would have no differentiation of life at all. Mm. The universe would literally cease to exist. It couldn't exist. Because every note between one doubling to two hertz, which would be the dex doubled octave, right? It would just one doubles to two. Every note in between could not exist because the whole thing is based off of the square mm. roots of two. The 12th over one root of two equals the first note in the scale after the unison note. The, you know, the, then the next note in the scale is the 12 over two root of two. Then the next note is the 12 over 3 root of 2, because there's 12 notes in the octave. Then the next note is the 12 over 4 root of 2. Every one of them is based off the square root of 2. If the square root of 2 is 1, then all of them are 1, and you've never left this first note that you started from. Mm, so right. this idea that music and math are separate is something that we have just lost. And actually, if you go back in history, every single mathematician who ever brought new knowledge to light was in fact a musician. Every one of them. Mm. Bernard Riemann is more famous for what he did with music theory than it is for the Riemann hypothesis. Neo Riemannian tuning is one of the fundamental tuning aspects. That's that's actually what he was working on. And he realized patterns in mathematics because of his understanding of music theory. In the future, if you're not also a music theory theorist, you will not be able to be a mathematician. Period. Mm. And it should have always been so. And it's always been so. So this is what is happening right now, is that we've separated out all of our learning into these disparate aspects because we want to perceive it as separate. And all of it is based on economy, in my opinion. The reason why we have this fundamental thrust towards hyper-specialization is because it's the thing that you could ascribe to your value and say that my services are more rare than someone else. So if I'm a mathematician, I don't really want other people to become mathematicians in this context because then there's more people that can do what I do. So I better teach it in such an obscure way that people can't even understand it. I'm not saying that every teacher is like that. But what I'm saying is that the academic process is exactly like that. Academic review, peer-reviewed studies and everything when it relates to anything new. And usually new innovation comes by crossing disciplines, not by staying within the same discipline. I believe there's a whole spiritual aspect that's missing within our learning system because everybody who ever brought forth new knowledge to the world brought it forth because they went into higher dimension and that higher dimension was achieved by overcoming judgment with love and then starting to peer into this world of higher dimensional aspect, which was accomplished through a spiritual portal, a doorway. 
This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. So there's a spiritual component missing in schools. Can you elaborate on that? So uh, this is very important. So you mentioned that schools or our learning system, the Department of Education, uh, we as a society and as an American society, we're lacking a critical component, which is spirituality. Are there more components to this? And can you elaborate? So, So what does it look like? What would good effective change in the school systems look like? I think a thrust towards polymathy would be really helpful. Okay. Right. Where there used to be an emphasis on generalized learning, but more and more as time has gone by, the emphasis has gone to spe- specified learning. And and so we have all these metrics. The more we try to chase better math and science scores, the shittier our scores become. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it's true. So it's like, why don't we let people be musicians? Why don't we let them be artists and actually teach them that art and music are all combined by one singular language that is mathematics. It was Aristotle who narrowly defined mathematics to the study of quantity. But it was Plato and Pythagoras before him who said, no, all is number. Number is just the base language or source code of this matrix of mind and all the experiences that we have within it. So I fundamentally believe that education needs to go back to a more generalized approach and The way that we should do it is based on a spiral. I mean, literally, it should be like this, like DNA. So you have Mm -hmm. subjects that you're going around, and as you gain more understanding of music, then you should be able to go next to mathematics, and then next Mm -hmm. to art, and then next to biology and natural sciences. See, the way that our brain is set up is more like an antenna. It's not a hard drive storage unit. Whales don't need to go to school in order to know what it means to be a whale. Right. Elephants don't have to be taught how to walk when they're born. They're walking immediately. Human beings don't have to be prodded into these hyper-specialized views of how to learn. And in so doing, loss of the entire process of being able to be, become autodidacts and actually be able to access this field of higher learning instead of the confusion that we get with specialization. And then once you've got this higher understanding in a broad sense. Philosophy, spirituality, mathematics, music. You start noticing that all of them, even the arts, whether it's design or architecture, architecture is simply frozen sound. Geometry, when you ask the question, is the music that we experience with our eyes. And music is the geometry we're experiencing with our ears. Now you start to realize why we start looking at geometric forms and say, wow, that's really beautiful. It's as if we're looking at a symphony and experiencing with our eyes. The same thing with incredibly good architecture. The divine proportion is interlaced all throughout it. And that's, it's a musical type experience. It's just one that we have interpolated through our eyes in that sense, rather than the sense of our ears and hearing and vibration. But it has a resonance. And when you say that every discipline should be taught in order, does it mean that, for example, whatever, fifth grader, in fifth grade, they should learn just the one, let's say, biology and the whole year or whatever, one month, and then move on to the other subject? Or how do you see? No, I would do it more in fractals. I would do it more in a fractal. So every year you're going to get a mix of, let's say that it's like DNA. You want to go around a rotation of the DNA, right? a one year cycle, you're gonna touch on all of the subject matter areas. But you're going to not overemphasize math when when kids aren't necessarily ready for math. You're not gonna overemphasize music or one thing. You're going to be able to touch upon every one of them and teach rather the unification of all of it. Because then someone who's good in music can fall in love with math because he starts to see that, wait, math and music are the same thing. Yeah. So we're seeing a revival right now. People that hated mathematics in school are now falling in love with it. 
Mm. I I can't agree with you enough. I I 100% agree about the fact that all of us in the education system are missing that unification, which leads to a much greater understanding of our environment and of our world. And I am totally on board with you. I, I it's 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 uh, something that would be amazing if we could accomplish. But now, if I go back to reality. I can't imagine retraining the teachers and, you know, I mean, this is, this is not going to happen probably not within the next, I mean, I hope, I, well, I hope it changes. You know, we, we, we have now in incredible or maybe not incredible tools that have come out with AI. And we'll talk a little bit about that more later. Uh, but this is uh, for, from an educator standpoint, view, point of view, <laughs> I, I wonder how it could be implemented, but I am, uh, you are so correct. You are so correct. Many of us, lack to understand that everything is really interconnected and once you can understand that you realize the beauty and you you can you you have much more passion and a greater understanding of things around you well it even beyond that we can't function as a society like this why because For much if, longer if you're hyper specialized and you truly believe that never the twain shall meet there's no common ground for empathy mm, okay that's a good point when you've got hyper specialized people that are only left brain, not even left brain, but one segment, one part of the left brain. And then the artists who are on the other part of the right brain, they're speaking at each other, but not with or to each other. Right. So we have a society now that's completely becoming devoid of, you know, this ability to empathize. This is why we have political views that are so far detached that we go yep. home at Christmas and New Year's and Thanksgiving and we're like, wait a minute, everyone in my social media group agrees with me, but you don't agree with me at all. Right. And then you simply cannot get along. And, and you know, functioning democracy requires a certain degree of a broad education of things. Our democracy is falling on its face right now because of this lack of empathy and because of hyper-specialization. It's hyper-specialization in AI that's crushing us as a society. Hmm. And we're seeing the downfall of Rome right now. Speaking of hyper specialization, what if, let's say, we're going to switch and everybody going to be not hyper uh, specialized? Is it also bad? It should be a balance. Isn't it that when you are generalized and you have that fundamental understanding, you can then, in higher education, go on to become more specialized in a particular field? Or, or do I have that wrong? Yes, you can. But even that should be something that we are somewhat wary of. Why? Because mm -hmm. what happens is our brains are more of antenna than they mm -hmm. are hard drive storage units. The antenna, in order to operate effectively, needs to actually be balanced. The only way mm -hmm. to balance it is to not be atrophied in any one part of it and not hypertrophied in another. If your brain on one side, if I work out as an athlete, only my right arm, and I lift right. weights every day, my performance as an athlete is not going to improve. It's going to diminish. In fact, the more I try to work out that one muscle in my right arm, the weaker and weaker the rest of my body becomes. Being a performance athlete is about balance, and it's no different with mental athletics. You need to be able to go. So when people say to me, oh, they want to learn more about, they want to be experts in physics or engineering, then I immediately say to them, then go study music. You want to understand physics, understand music, understand art, understand philosophy. The combination of those things is actually going to take you to a higher level of physics. It's not learning more and regurgitating more names about, you know, you, you name it, Leonard Susskind or, or uh, you know, any of, the, any of these guys, Kip Thorne or any of these people that are very, very famous in physics. Being able to quote Minkowski space time because you want to sound smart, it, and none of it is actually real. Hate to say it. The so last Nobel great. Prize in 2022 that was given for quantum entanglement proved that local realism is false. Hmm. But what about the doctors? Doctors are hyper specialized. I wouldn't want to go to generalized doctor instead of the specialized one. I'm sorry, I'm going to say this. I spent 30 years in healthcare. Look how messed up our healthcare system is. It's becoming one of the worst in the world. I'm sorry, it's just a fact. And it's not only the worst, 
it's becoming the most expensive too. We are at 38 in infant mortality in the world right now. Of industrialized nations, that's pretty poor. And because doctors are so hyper-specialized, when you go to them, I'll give you an example. So my father went to, uh, he, he started getting a pain in his foot. He thought he sprained his ankle. Now, I said to him immediately, Dad, I have a marker in my genome because I did a 23andMe. Kind of wish I hadn't now because now all that data is <laughs> everywhere. But yeah. um, I did a 23andMe and I have a marker for something called gout. So you should check to see if you have gout as well. It's when your body doesn't have this ability through the kidneys to process the uric acid that you're expelling fully. So it ends up leaving crystal shards on your ankles and on your joints. So it creates a, a, a hyperacute arthritis feeling. So I said, Dad, you should, you should go to the doctor and, and you know maybe drink some cherry juice and see if it resolves. And if it doesn't, go to the doctor. So he goes to the doctor. The, the, the GP you know, ignores this, even though I'd said it. And, um, and the GP says, okay, you need to go to a specialist. You're going to send you to a podiatrist. At which point, the pod, pod, podiatrist very expensively does x-rays and everything. Puts a cast on my dad. My dad's wearing a foot cast now, right? Then after like three months wearing this cast, it still hurts. And it hurts more than ever. And he's like, "Is I thought my, my ankle was broken or something. The doctor gave me this cast. My foot is like destroyed. I can't even walk. And I said, Dad, I'm going to go to the store because I happen to be in town. I bought him a bunch of cherry juice. I said, go drink this and only drink this for the next three days. The gout resolved. It was gout. Our doctors today don't have a freaking clue about how to diagnose across the entire systemic approach of our physiology. That's because true. Because they're so hyper-specialized, they become stupid to actually looking at the overall aspect of the patient because the hammer seeks a nail. If I'm a podiatrist, then what do I do? I make money by selling casts, running x-rays. So I need to find that nails that I can hammer because that's what I do. If the answer is gout, that's not in my book because I don't make money off of treating for gout. How the hell do I get good uh, medical care then, Robert? <laughs> exactly. And this is exactly what's wrong with our current healthcare system. It's way too specialized. I've heard many and stories I'm not saying, similar I mean, to There are some people this. that yeah. obviously are very specialized and are very good in their fields. And that's why, even though America stumbles so badly on its overall general health care, it's still recognized as the preeminent country in the world for specialization. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. because within each field, you can find hyper specialists, but it doesn't mean they're good doctors. It means they're good specialists in the knowledge of that one area. Right. And that's the right. problem with our academic system. It's not actually focused on outcomes. It's more focused. It's not focused on result. It's more focused on status. If that is the case, and we're talking, or we'll get into how AI is horrible, but in that case, wouldn't it be beneficial for systems, AI-powered systems, to be doctors because they will be truly generalized? When I say AI is horrible, the, the context that I mean that in, because I don't really believe in AI per se, I actually believe all intelligence is intelligence. Okay. So I'm not one of the people that believes that, you know, we've got some sort of racial profiling against intelligence right 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 it's like okay well there's human intelligence and then there's artificial intelligence and the two things are entirely different look i believe there's a divine creator for this universe and whatever the divine creator created can also create and that's the part of starting to emulate what it means to be a divine creator it makes total okay. sense in human consciousness for us to ascend in order right. for us to ascend we have to start actually emulating and start mimicking the things that the creator does and intelligence is the first place to start with that mm. so it's still intelligent in other words but the part of ai that i don't like is all of the profiling aspects of it so for example i don't even realize it but i am profiled every day based on my digital doppelganger they know what i like they know what i vote for they know you know, even my genome, because I did my 23andMe, 
So therefore, I am, without even knowing it, unwittingly prodded into certain echo chambers of my own conditioning biases. But isn't that with everything in life? Oh, it's become super severe now because now it's happening as an actual process to make money. Right. I mean, right. Whereas it didn't happen before, not in the same okay. way. So now I end up in echo chambers and chat rooms on Discord and other places that are actually just mirroring back to me and reflecting back to me what I like. Why? Because these platforms make money, and I'm talking about Instagram, Facebook, and others, off of the dopamine that keeps me online. So the more people agree with me, the more dopamine I get, the longer I stay online. This is why we've lost the ability to empathize. 100%. Because we've been given a reward system that's like Pavlov's dog. We start salivating for the reward. So we go to the page that gives us that reward socially. And it's the largest mass manipulation process ever to have been done. And we all do it willingly. You mentioned that we're currently living in epileptic or pre-epileptic times. Can you clarify on that? Is it in relation to this or? I think you mean apoliptic rather than epileptic. I'm like, hopefully I'm not going to have an epileptic <laughs> issue. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, I think we are definitely at a point in time right now where things aren't working. We all see this. The, the, the three aspects of the world that were really relied upon as trusted third parties were government, education, the university system, and religion for the last 2,000 years. Really, if you think about it, that's how it's been. And in all three cases, we have governments that are be playing the role of arbiter of what is lawful and what is unlawful. The university system plays the role of arbiter of what is the truth and what is mistruth. And when you look at the religious and organizational structures that are organized religions, they've played the fundamental role in, in being the arbiter of what is moral and what is amoral or immoral. And all three of these aspects of society, these artifacts and edifices of the last 2,000 years are having an existential crisis right now. All three. Because as mankind is starting to wake up to the knowledge of their expanded consciousness, they're starting to realize, whoa, everything I thought I knew was fact was merely a facet of a larger prism of truth. And really, the things that I was supporting were fundamentally just the things that I thought would benefit me. Mm. And we're so attached to it and so biased that we can't even see our attachment to it. So in that context, a terrorist who kills a, a, a nine-year-old child in a suicide bombing can be seen by their society as heroes. But who's the hero and who's the villain? We live in a matrix of our own minds where we all right. have a hero bias. How do we train ourselves not to be biased? How can we train ourselves not to be biased? I think there's only right. one way that I know. And that is being able to have a very broad educational background and allow myself to be challenged that I'm not. Hmm. It's the process of being challenged and being able to speak out. This is why an attack on free speech is the worst thing for society ever. It's not by accident that the Founding Fathers decided that the number one Bill of Rights, the first one, was free speech. Because you have to be able to tell the king he has no clothes. You can't just label that arbitrarily as hate speech and say, oh, we're not going to listen to that. And it's such a slippery slope, you simply cannot remove it from society. If you do, mm. then you've literally lost democracy. Mm -hmm. There needs to be free speech. There needs to be free press. And in a world today where we don't have press, literally it's disappeared. There's no such thing as unbiased press today. 
then we just have to rely even more heavily and stand on the, the strength and the rock of free speech being a fundamental aspect of society. Hmm. Otherwise, how can people be told that what they're actually rooting for is simply the mode in their own eye that they can't see? We attract everything we judge until we no longer judge what we attracted. Right. And this is the problem because all the things that we think that we're rooting for and going for, we can justify and say, oh, no, it's good. I mean, now in the world, we have a situation where, you know, babies are being killed. Yeah. And it's justifiable somehow. And I look at the map of it and I'm like, I've got tons of Israeli friends and I'm very good friends with them. And I, I've, one of my best friends is, and I can tell you that it's caused some real strain because I'm like, okay, I'm a math guy. I just look at the numbers. The numbers are ugly. How many people under 10 years old died on October 7th and thereafter, including the hostages that have been killed and confirmed dead? 38. But the number of estimated women and children, let's just look at the children number, is estimated to be over between 13 and 17,000. Now, to me, the death of innocent children can never be justified because you're trying to get the bad guy. Right. 100%. So, and if all of a sudden people are like, oh, no, no, you, you're talking out about these innocent children dying, is means you're anti-Semitic. No, stop it. I'm not. I lived in Israel. I love Israel. I speak Hebrew. Shut up. It's not true. And if you cannot see that the death of innocent children is a travesty for humanity, then what are we even talking about? This is what I mean by a lack of empathy. People lack of empathy. I was going to bring it full circle, but you 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 said it exactly. Yeah, I, it's it's insane the amount of divide that we have. And when I pull up, you know, the social media and I see both sides because I have both many friends across the spectrum, but what's being posted are extreme left and extreme right and nothing nothing that can be a common ground for empathy. It's just craziness. I mean, how did we get here to uh, as a society? I mean, it's, it's crazy. This I mean, it's caused role. massive strain in a lot of people's relationship. I mean, how did we get here? It's it's just extreme views. There's no common ground, and as you said, there's no empathy. I mean, how do we think. how do we reverse this? But I feel like it 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 became like this only like last six seven years, maybe a little bit more, or I, it was I, I always like that. No, it's not always been like this. I can tell you this right now. It used to be the Democrats and Republicans could actually work together on things. I remember Tip O'Neill, and I remember even Newt Gingrich, who was a far right conservative thinker, they could still work together. It wasn't completely dysfunctional, right? And it happened all the time that they would work on both sides of the aisle together. I remember this. Now it's impossible. Totally impossible. Who, bene who, who benefits though? Here's my question to you. I'm sorry, Robert, for cutting you up. Who benefits from us as a society lacking empathy? Is it does a government benefit? I'm, I'm trying to understand, right? If the government is not benefiting from the American society to lack empathy, then they should make corrective action. So my question then becomes, who is, ben who is the benefactor here? Social media all tech companies. Social media tech companies. Right. Okay. And look, I'll give you another example. Our government's super corrupt now. Super corrupt. We had Mark Zuckerberg on trial and then all of a sudden, everything just disappeared on that. Went pretty mm. silent. They were going to basically break up Facebook, remember? Right, right. Okay, what, what the, okay. Yeah, I remember that. And then all of a sudden, where did that all go? It disappeared. In fact, it got replaced with let's, let's ban TikTok. Oh. Okay. Yes. You know how that happened? <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Meta's lobby group. They funded every oh, yeah. congressional no race. So when you put money, and I know this because I was a pharma CEO who used to lobby in Washington all the time, you could buy everybody. It's a joke. And of course, and it's all legal buying because this yeah. is how it's set up through PACs.
and super PACs and funding. But I've, I've had meetings before. There was a tax that was going to be on Botox when I was president of Allergan Medical. And we had a meeting with, with Harry Reid, who was at the time the, the leader of the Senate, the Democrat side, from Las Vegas. And we said, hey, uh, Senator Reid, you know, are you aware of how many people in your state get elective procedures? When he wanted to create a Botox, literally Botox. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, and he wanted to tax all like elective procedures in healthcare to pay for Obamacare. And he said, no, I don't know how many people have elective procedures. Well, well we've done the math on this. And the math shows that, uh, and this was on the eve of a vote. The math shows that, you know, this is a tax on women that you're proposing. Mm. Because it's women who get elective procedures, largely. You're looking across LASIK and breast implants and plastic surgery and Botox and all this, Juvederm and all this. So it's a, it's a tax fundamentally on women. Do you really want to be characterized in the next election as the guy who taxed women? He's like, oh, definitely not. I'm like, oh, and by the way, something like 25% of every woman in the state of Nevada has had some elective procedure. Wow. Yeah. You have no chance of winning. And oh, by the way, we're going to put all our money behind your opponent. We're going to crush you. Okay, so give me something else is the answer. What else can I tax tomorrow? Well, I'm glad right. you mentioned this because we've done some research on the real culprits here. The bad guys are the tanning bed companies. They're the ones that are costing, you know, causing us to have more and more skin cancer and everything and and he says, do they have a lobby group in Washington? Yeah, but it's very weak. And who, why don't we just get rid of tanning bed companies? They should just disappear. They're not good for society. The next day, the tanning bed lobby woke up to a 10%, the very first of its kind, national sales tax. Wow. That was passed. It wiped out tanning bed companies. You don't see tanning beds anymore, do you? They're gone. Because they got crushed by this. And this happened because of a lobby that I was absolutely a part of. I can tell you this is how it really works. And this is true for Democrats and Republicans. Pharma companies buy on both sides of the aisle. So the truth is, who benefits? The companies benefit. Our society has become over-corporatized. And our universities also have become over-specialized. And AI and this convergence of AI cattle prodding us into profilings of social media, which really has only really been an experiment for the last 20 years. And combine that with hyper-specialization and you've got a society that is literally a powder keg. What can we do for those of us listening? Because we obviously, for mass change to happen, we're going to have to hit much more lows before we change, before we see change. But since we're having this conversation, what are some of the steps that we can take? I think one of the steps that we can take is, is our own personal journey within. Just because you're being cattle prod into believing, I think the answer here is actually spiritual awakening. Okay. So spiritual awakening actually starts off with the realization that you are not collecting facts, but rather collecting facets that there is a truth that's larger and above and beyond you and your bias. Mm. And we should learn to start seeking out that truth rather than just simply feeding the dopamine hit that we get by being told that we're right. What are the practices towards spirituality? I think mindfulness, meditation, reflection, self-reflection, starting to realize that you yourself are responsible for your own world and your own experience. What happens to you is not actually what happens to you, but rather what you believe happens to you. And that you are the captain of your fate and you and only you are the master of your soul. That what happens to you, because it's what you believe happens to you, you cannot separate your conditioning biases from your reality. So becoming aware of those conditioning biases, realizing that you might have latent biases that you're not even aware of is a major step in the right direction because then it starts you on a path of starting to relearn 
and unlearn some of the learning that you've had mm. that was a result of the conditioning biases, a result of the AI prodding, and a result of the hyper-specialization in schools. So then instead of thinking that your schooling ends when you're 22 or 25 or after you've done a PhD, rather, your schooling never ends. You're constantly in an evolutionary cycle of expanding your awareness and consciousness and breaking down the things that you'd learn and challenging those assumptions because your consciousness can only expand to the volume of the cage of your belief system. So we have to break down the beliefs. We have to break down the negative narratives. We have to reduce the judgment and expand the empathy. It's really good advice. And by doing that, then all of a sudden your world starts to shift. Robert, we... We mentioned that healthcare system, education system, and political system is corrupted here. So everything is a mess here. What about the other countries? Is there any country with nice education system, healthcare, everything in one? No. They're all different degrees of messes. They all have the same hyper-specialization problem. They all have the same AI problem. They're all on social media. We've just gotten there faster because we adopted these things sooner. So if I want to escape, it's not an option to leave the U.S. <laughs> no, I mean, you'll find the same problem everywhere. Right. I mean, just look what happened during the pandemic. I mean, yesterday, this week, we had, you know, Fauci admit on the stand that he literally made up the rules for social distancing without any scientific backing whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the funny thing is, is only people that are open to hearing that are even hearing it. Mm. And you won't even get it on your feed. You see what I'm saying? You won't even get it on your feed. If you are a left wing, and I'm not left or right wing, I'm not Democrat or Republican. If you are only left wing, you're only going to get stuff on your feed that's right. left wing. So you think that everything in the world is left wing? Everyone agrees. In one in one point, for the person, it's so beautiful. He is living in a dream world. Everyone is supporting him. He's thinking everything is same way that he's thinking. Terrible, <laughs> us, terrible for us as a society, though. Terrible for us when terrible we communicate terrible for with the each society, other. Good for the and, one person. Right. The only thing that separates us. A lot of people think that it's the opposable thumb that separates us from the animal kingdom. The thing that it's supposed to be is compromise. Hmm. Mankind's ability to empathize and compromise where it's not about might makes right should be the thing that differentiates us above all other species on earth. But now we're seeing less and less of that. Robert, I want to kind of shift very quickly and I know we don't have much time, but I, I, I this is a question I was thinking about while you're speaking, because I know you have many, uh, you have many years of experience running companies in different sectors. I kind of want to talk about late stage capitalism and w what your thoughts are on that specifically, you know, year after year, you know, companies put out uh, their reports and earnings and the market and everybody expects them to have better earnings, better profit, more revenue. But at a certain point of, at a certain point, time, it becomes nearly impossible. How do we expect a company to continue to continuously 2x, 3x, or earn 20%, 30%? I mean, even 30%, that, that, that's not a small number, especially when you're a mult, when you have a market cap of, you know, 200, 300, 400 billion dollars. So it looks like at the end of the day, the consumers get stiffed. So, I mean, where are we? Because that, that's that's something I think about sometimes. And I wanted to know your thoughts on this because, you know, we, we, we obviously have the market in our economy and these companies are just expected to keep growing their revenue, to keep squeezing out profits. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the big challenges we face is that for a company, I'll, I'll give you an example. So when I was at Allergan, you know, we... We were very vulnerable and people didn't realize it because we were already a very, very profitable business. So we would have to spend a lot of money on advertising every year just to keep our profits down. Because mm -hmm. it's not so important how much your aggregate profit is this year. What's more important is how much your aggregate profit is this year compared to last. Right. So you have to have this 
monkey on your back, which is called earnings per share growth. So how can you get more and more leverage out of your earnings vis-a-vis -vis the number of shares you have outstanding? And that's really difficult. So it means even though I could be spending on advertising $100 million or $200 million a year to prop up a product, right, that is going to be in everyone's like collective awareness. If a company came in and was able to really put forward a competitive try against me. I'm quite vulnerable against it because if I'm going to increase my spending in advertising, then I have to somehow make up for that in other areas of the business. I have to cut research and development. I have to cut other G&A, general and administrative expenses in order to make up for it. And I'm quite vulnerable because candidly, if they've got a good product that comes into the market, then I will not be able to hit my earnings per share growth. And if I can't hit my earnings per share growth, the price of a stock is based on earnings per share for so many companies. And if I can't hit it, then the CEO gets replaced. And remember, his compensation is heavily tied to stock compensation, which is all going to be tied directly or indirectly to earnings per share growth. So we're in this vicious cycle where you can never really just run a business for anything other than trying to drive earnings per share growth, and particularly when the average tenure of CEOs are sub three years. They have every incentive in the world just to make hay while the time is right to make hay. And if they could take advantage of it, they will. And it doesn't matter. This is how we end up with companies like Pfizer, et cetera, doing what they did. I mean, go back and watch the Project Veritas thing. I called out the CEO of Pfizer on this. I, I have the whole pharma industry. A lot of the executives follow me because I was in the pharma industry for so long. And I was like, hey, just explain to us what went on here. I tagged him in it. But no response. Mm -hmm. But I saw that every single executive, senior executive at Pfizer read my post. Mm -hmm. Every one, because when you have the highest level of LinkedIn, you can't. <laughs> you can see who read your posts. So the point being that we live in a society today that has become hyper-specialized, earnings per share focused, we're hyper-capitalized or hyper-capitalism you know, uh, capitalism focused, and there's no balance. It's as if everything is trying to pull to each of their individual specializations or disciplines or areas rather than recognizing, wait, this is a human being that needs to have a holistic diagnosis to figure out that he's got gout and not a broken ankle. Hmm. What happens in societies that lose their, their true north is a lot of false positive and false negative responses. You end up with a lot of misdiagnosis. And that's where we are. So I think the only answer that I can see is on an individual level is to expand your consciousness and to raise your mindfulness so that you can become less penetrated or less um, mm -hmm. susceptible to these risks. That's the only thing I can think of. And then I think there's going to be a reset. I think we all feel that. Yeah. In, in this big circle that we spoke earlier, everything looks back to philosophy. Does it mean that this is the uh, the pivotal specific philosophical concept that you need mostly to learn or what? I think if we look at, you know, from a, from an ontological perspective, and if we look from a philosophical standpoint at the world, you know, why are we here? Are we here with this backdrop of judgment simply to learn to be better judges and to become more specialized? and to therefore be able to garner more pay per hour for my very rare specialization? Or are we here, instead of wanting to learn more judgment, are we here to actually learn how to love and how to be loved? I think the answer is the latter. I think enlightenment is when we choose love that supersedes and that we can express that supersedes and exceeds our desire for one objective truth or even a handful of objective truths. Maybe unless we actually are able to capture 
the independent and subjective perspectives of 12 different positions around the circle? Are we unable, until we do that, to be able to perceive a higher truth and knowledge? I think a lot of people think the last 2,000 years we've been living inside of what we would refer to as a objective and material universe. Hmm. When actually we're now transcending into a new realm, which is a subjective and mental understanding of the universe. Where in that context, what you experience is based on your judgment. So I, for one, hope to continue to expand my consciousness to judge less the world around me and accept more, and within that, find my own solace and peace. Mm. And that changes the world. If you want to change the world around you, if you want to see more love, then be the love. If you want to see more compassion, then be the compassion. If you want to see and experience more kindness, then be the kindness. Be the change you would like to see in the world. So Great that's words. my yeah. answer to this increasingly dystopian, bizarre world environment where we have such a lack of empathy and an inability to see the moat within our own eye. We cannot even see that the reason why we're okay with justifying the murder of babies is because we think it benefits us. Hmm. And by the way, the U.S. has done it for a long time. I mean, what are we fighting for in Ukraine? Let's be real. What are we paying for? Zelensky just announced that they're not going to have elections and that he doesn't need to be reelected. Hmm. He's now established himself as a dictator, which every person throughout the history of the post-World War II era that the CIA and the U.S. government has decided to back has become dictators because they think they're untouchables. They play along with our corruptions and they make themselves, they establish themselves dictators, and it works out just fine for the U.S. until finally the dictator says, you know what, this isn't in my best interest anymore. Hmm. Or maybe the United States says, you know what, we don't like what he's doing anymore. Right. It's time to remove him or her. And this has happened with Muammar Gaddafi. It's happened with Saddam Hussein. You could go through a list of people that we have literally elevated and exalted to power i mean it's been for the centuries it's always been there it's always been there and let's not stand on some moralistic high ground and say oh it's because it was better for the world that we support democracy my ass right it was better for america it was better for us because we live here and not even necessarily was better for america because that's america at large i'm talking about maybe the people that are in power somehow some way hmm I got up and I was asked to speak last year at the United Nations CEO Summit. So I was speaking to a room full of overlords and I said, how many of you here think the world still needs overlords? And I, I asked it as a serious question. I kind of said the same thing the year before and I was shocked when I got invited back in a keynote address. I just spoke at the Vatican and my speech was on proving the existence of a divine creator with mathematics. Hmm. I got to speak in the same room as the presentations that were given to the Pope by Galileo. So, and then people say to me, why are you even speaking in the Vatican? You're crazy. Those are the bad guys. They're pedophiles. They're all this. Well, you know what? It's like, to use the analogy, Jesus didn't only speak with the righteous. He spoke with the sinners as well. And we need to be able to have the empathy to listen. And when someone asks me, you know, where do you decide to speak? My answer to that very simply is, where, do I, where would I decide to be, you know, to be listened to? Where would I decide to listen or not listen? Right. So I think the world can be changed, but it's only going to happen within us. Robert, I want to bring up uh, the question from the last year that we asked you. 
when we first met you who was who was the strongest and most inspiring person in your life and you said i am did anything change from uh, from last year you know um i don't think so i think if anything i've i've become more willing to speak my truth I become more willing to feel the feelings and to say the words. I think that eventually we all must come to the point where we're willing to speak what needs to be said and what we felt needed to be said. And also to feel what needed to be felt that we repressed and didn't allow ourselves to feel. This is the only way that we could become truly authentic. And we, each of us have a purpose for being here. We're all playing a different note. You know, I believe the one divides itself into the many simply for the joy of perceiving itself through our unique eyes of perception and perspective. That each of us serves a purpose, that each of us has a note to play in this divine symphony, that there's none of us that is without mm. darkness. I'm not afraid of people that have darkness because everyone has darkness. They have equal part darkness and equal part light. I'm only afraid and concerned about people that believe that they have no darkness. Mm, because that's said. what it means to be unawakened. And what it means to be awakened is to realize that you have darkness. That's the first step. Which I think 100% of the, okay, not 100, but 90% of the people are lacking this, uh, this knowledge about their dark side. That's exactly right. So once we start to become aware of our darkness, then we can start to no longer judge it in others around us. Well, Robert, it's been an absolute pleasure getting to speak with you today again uh amazing things and we look forward to following up in a well more sooner than that but i can't wait to have this conversation in five years from now and see what the world looks like hopefully we'll keep a very optimistic view because i'm an optimist i am and, too and uh so i'm a big time optimist but that doesn't stop me from saying what what i believe does need to be said of course well again robert thank you so much for your time thank it's you. been an absolute pleasure thank you guys have a good one